Okay, welcome everybody. Let's get started. Uh, I graded your quizzes and the scores are posted on MU Online. I'll hand back the papers now. Um, of course, you can see on the schedule that the next assessment that we've got is the exam, but that's not until the end of February, so you've got a little bit of time uh, until that pops up. The next thing that you do need to submit, though, is homework number four. Homework four only consists of two problems. And there's a handout for that uh, that's posted on MU Online. And I printed it, but I uh, forgot to grab it. So while you're working on some preliminary calculations during an example today, I'll run downstairs and uh, grab that off of the copy machine so we can talk about it at the end of class. So today what we're going to do is start to talk about water flowing through a pipe network <coughs> when there's more than a single route for the fluid particles to take to get to another point. And so in our last lecture on Thursday, we were talking about the situation where three pipes come together and how that can be complicated when it's gravity flow uh, into a middle reservoir. So today is a, another complication, which is when there's more than a single route. So are there any questions before we get into the new material? All right. You've seen the Moody diagram before. And I think on previous occasions, I've pointed out that dashed line on the Moody diagram. So that dashed line, just graphically speaking, divides the F value curve portion that's flat and the portion of the curve that is curved. And so that means something. You know, if, if we take that on the horizontal axis, it's the Reynolds number. And so you can think of the Reynolds number broadly as the velocity of the flow. If the velocity of the flow goes up, the Reynolds number goes up. Now, of course, kinematic viscosity, diameter, those things also affect Reynolds number. But let's say that we have a given pipe. So the diameter isn't changing. It's a certain pipe with a certain fluid, water. And so the flow conditions are variable. So it's the velocity that's changing. If you have a low velocity through the pipe, that gives you a low Reynolds number. If, it, if you have a high velocity through the pipe, then you've got a high Reynolds number. Relative roughness is on the vertical axis. Who can uh, remind us, what is relative roughness? OK, that's the numerator in relative roughness. You're right. It's the equivalent sand diameter. And so it's that in the numerator. And what about in the denominator? Diameter of the pipe. So what the relative roughness is asking, is the pipe really rough relative to its diameter? So here's D, the diameter of the pipe. And then K sub S would be like, or epsilon. K sub S equals epsilon. So we're saying, how does like the equivalent diameter, if we're going to try and express those roughness features as a circular, a spherical uh, grain of sand, what would be the equivalent diameter of that compared to the roughness of the pipe? OK. So let's say that we have that certain pipe. I already said it's a certain pipe, and so its material isn't going to change, and its diameter isn't going to change. So we've got some relative roughness that we start with. What this means, this line, it means that there's a certain Reynolds number for which any greater Reynolds number is no longer changing the F value. So look at this. If we had a relative roughness of 0.01, and we go down here to the horizontal axis, that looks like 9.5 times 10 to the fifth. No, I'm sorry, that would be 10 to the fourth since we're working towards the left. So 9.5 times 10 to the fourth. Anything more than that, and you can keep increasing the flow rate, and it doesn't change the F value at all. Because over here on the uh, left vertical axis is where we're trying to read what is the F value for these circumstances. Remember, the whole reason we like the Darcy-Wiesbach equation is that these F values are dynamic. They allow us to understand how much energy is being lost as a function of not only the material, but also the flow conditions. 
whereas the Manning's N value and the Hayes and Williams C value, those only look at the material properties but not the flow conditions. This is more powerful, it's more accurate, it's more reliable, and that's why we like it. But what it's saying is that the F value doesn't get any higher or lower once you get to a certain threshold velocity. You can keep, crank you can keep cranking up the uh, velocity even more and the F value isn't changing. But below that threshold, the, the F value depends on not only the relative roughness, but also the Reynolds number. So this dividing line is sometimes called fully turbulent flow. Here on the figure, you can see it's called complete turbulence, or it's a rough pipe. So what fully turbulent flow means is that the water is going through a conduit so quickly that it no longer matters if the velocity increases anymore. It's just at that point, once the velocity is really high, the friction factor only depends on the relative roughness. So what I've just taught you, or what, what I've just explained, you need to understand well enough that you could write a cogent answer to explain what is fully turbulent flow. That's how important it is. You really need to understand the why of what fully turbulent flow is. So here's the Jane equation. What we're saying is, what happens if you turn up the velocity really high? So look at the Jane equation. Where is velocity? I don't see the letter V in the Jane equation. Where is velocity? It's hiding. It's in the Reynolds number. Okay, so what happens to the Jane equation if you substitute a really big Reynolds number down in the denominator of this second term inside the brackets? It gets really small. Yeah, so a big Reynolds number means this term gets very small. And so the assumption, this is a tool, this fully turbulent assumption is a tool that we can use to solve some problems that otherwise would be too indeterminate for us. We wouldn't know where to start. But if we make this assumption, well, let's assume that we've got a big velocity going through that pipe. Then as a first step, it allows us to begin calculations that otherwise we'd struggle to. So here's how we can simplify the Jane equation if we're invoking that assumption. What should you do anytime you make an assumption? Afterwards? Pray, yeah, verify, verify is maybe more reliable. Am I going to get struck by saying that? <laughs> verify that, uh, verify that actually it was fully turbulent flow conditions. And so what we do is, just keep this in your mind, this is a, a really nice assumption, but you're going to see this on your equation sheet and you're going to be like, wow, this is great. It's so much easier to calculate the F value with this function than that one. Don't use it when you're not supposed to. You know, the fully turbulent flow is just uh, like, well, I'm temporarily in this bind. I can't proceed unless I make the assumption, but I'm going to circle back later and check it to make sure that it was a reasonable thing to assume because flow velocity isn't always really high. Sometimes flow velocity is low, but it's a starting point is what I'm getting at. So here's how we could uh, reconfigure the Colebrook equation. If we were assuming the same thing, we're assuming really high velocity means big Reynolds number. Big Reynolds number means that this second term effectively moves towards zero. Or even if it's not zero, it's so small compared to k sub s divided by d by the relative roughness ratio, it's so small that it doesn't have any meaningful effect on the F value. Okay, so any questions about this fully turbulent flow assumption? All right, so in the 80s, Ronald Reagan always had this saying about the Russians that you should trust them, but then you should verify what they say. Trust but verify. Here with the fully turbulent flow, it's assume but verify. All right, so on an exam, I'm delighted for you to use the fully turbulent flow assumption, but you need to verify at the end for full credit. All right. I think I've emphasized it. All right. You remember continuity equation. That's chapter five from fluid mechanics. And what that says is that if we have three pipes, flow is coming together at some junction, 
or a node. Node is another word for junction. So what goes in must go out as long as there is no place for storage within that junction. And so if we draw a control surface around some point where there's three pipes coming together, the combination of flow in and flow out has to be equal. And in this, what I've depicted here, there's no tank where the water level could rise and fall. If there is a tank, then flow in doesn't have to equal flow out necessarily. Um, because you could be having a loss or gain in storage. Remember, that's the other term of the uh, Reynolds transport theorem. There's storage and transport. Here what we're saying is, let's just look at a sealed junction or a node where the flow through the single pipe that's receiving the two flows is going to be the sum of each of the flows individually. Okay, that's not groundbreaking, but what we're going to do is apply it to situations like this, where we have pipe going, uh, water flowing through a pipe, and then the flow splits, and we're not exactly sure how much is going through either of the pipes. Now, I emphasize that this is a top view, but it could have been a side view. It doesn't really matter. The configuration of the pipes whether they're vertically oriented or horizontally oriented, isn't going to have any effect on the flow rate through either. But there are things that do affect the flow rate through either of those pipes. And we're going to talk about those. But not before I show you a picture of my favorite West Virginia ski resort, Winter Place. Anybody been to Winter Place before? I, that's the only one I've been to. So when I call it my favorite West Virginia ski resort, that's kind of by default. So it's the, as Homer Simpson says, default is the uh, two sweetest words in the English language. So, uh, winter place, the point I want to make is, what if you stop, start at the top of the mountain? And um, so you're here at the top of the mountain. Imagine yourself ready to go down the plunge. It's the black diamond. And ultimately, what you're shooting for is uh, the resort center, because they have a variety of delicious sandwiches and beverages available. So you're going from the top of the mountain to the snack bar. What if you take this ridge line, compromise, buttermilk, cascade, and finally you're over here at the, uh, at the uh, snack bar. Think about the energy difference between where you started and where you ended. Assuming that you start motionless and you end motionless, all of your energy was just your elevation. It was the potential energy. Now, so you took that ridge line route. What if you go this other route? What if you go Woods Run, and then Snowfield, Panorama Glades, and finally you get to the snack bar? Different route. Um, how much energy was lost as you went from the top to the snack bar? It's the same amount. You get what I'm, you get what I'm playing at here. Is it doesn't matter what route you take. If your starting point and your ending point are the same, the energy loss is equal. So that's true on the ski hill. That's also true in pipes. And so let's consider this simplified pipe network where we have the water splitting. And we're trying to have a sense for how much goes through this top pipe and how much goes through the bottom pipe. And what we know about energy loss is uh, when you're skiing, maybe it's your change in elevation. When you're talking about flow through a pipe, here's how you can calculate energy loss. Darcy-Wiesbach equation. The friction factor, the pipe length, the flow velocity, then down in the denominator, the diameter, two, and then gravitational acceleration. All right, so first hypothetical. What if it's the same pipe length, same pipe diameter, and same pipe material in the top and the bottom pipe? So essentially, they're identical, except for that in their location. Their location is different. So um, how much water would go through the top pipe versus the bottom pipe? Bottom pipe? Probably the same. Why do you think that? Mm -hmm. I could have said, well, they're the same color. So consider, consider this. You're right, by the way. He's right. I'm not pushing back because he's wrong. I'm pushing back because I want us to find like the, uh, 
what's the nugget of truth that's broadly applicable there? You're right. So explain why you're right with this equation. Because the, so your velocity isn't changing. OK. Which um, you have a pretty weak Q in, uh -huh. you know, Q out. Yep. The diameter is not changing. OK. The length of them isn't changing. Gravity, obviously, is, is a constant. So there's, I mean, just, and you're going from point A to point B. Good. Like on the, Good. The shape, so. All right. Yes. You're definitely headed in the right direction. We're almost all the way there. Anybody else want to take a crack at also adding their thoughts? Yeah? Um, good point. No, there is energy loss. What we're saying is that the route, that the, uh, the amount of energy loss is the same, regardless of what route you take. But that doesn't mean that the starting energy at this junction is the same as the ending junction. In fact, um, because there's flow, we know that's not true. There wouldn't be flow if there wasn't a difference in energy at these two junctions. And so this is the upstream junction, and this is the downstream junction. So there is an energy loss. Why is there two cars? Wouldn't that be uh, part of the equation for the distance between That's an interesting question. Um, now, that all depends on what the diameter of the pipes is and compared to the diameter of the starting pipe. But let's just all agree that if I think everybody can agree if it's same length, diameter, and material. So if we look here at the, this equation, those are the factors that affect the energy loss. And so the water is going to preferentially go the easiest route. Um, and so if they're equal, both of the routes are, are the same difficulty, or there's the same energy loss opportunity through both of the routes. And so there won't be a difference in flow. But all right, let's make it a little more interesting. Same diameter, same length, but now pipe B is more rough than pipe C. So what's the comparison of the flow? One of them gets more flow, one gets less. C gets more flow. Because it's the easier. Yeah, B is going to have less flow because it's more rough. And so it's not going to be the same amount of flow through each, because if there was, then that would mean that there's more head loss through the rougher pipe. And that can't be true. They both have to have the same amount of head loss. There has to be the same amount of head loss through pipe B as there is through pipe C. So the only way to make sure that you have the same amount of head loss when one of the pipes is rougher is to decrease how much flow is going through that pipe. And then it brings it back into equilibrium. So the generalizable rule that we're going to have to apply here is you have the same energy lo loss regardless of route, as long as we start and end at the same spot. OK, now what about this one? See if you can reason through which is going to have more flow, pipe C or B. C will have more flow. Why? Bigger diameter, less resistance. OK? All right, now let's complicate things. So B is now the bigger pipe. So we'd think, all right, B is getting more flow. Uh, the length is shorter, and pipe C is more rough. Are we still able to know for a certainty which pipe gets more flow? I think each of those says B is going to have more flow, because in each case, it's easier for water to flow through B than to go through C, because B is bigger, so that makes it easier for the water to flow through that. Bigger is easier flow than smaller diameter, at least in terms of you know, friction loss equation. A big D means less friction loss, and so that's when I say easier. It's not like the, uh, the water's having an emotional experience as it travels through the pipes. What we're saying is how much energy is lost as it goes through the conduit. And so uh, there's more flow if the diameter is bigger, a shorter length uh, in the, hold on, did I just confuse myself? Length is longer. Ah, OK, so a longer length. Now, that's in the numerator, and so that's going the opposite direction. And so if it's a longer one, then that would say, you know, in this first decision point of diameter, B is the more flow. But then since pipe 
C is shorter, then that would argue that there's more flow through C. And so we don't know the relative magnitude of each of these. They're kind of canceling each other out, potentially. And pipe C is more rough, but we don't know how much more rough. So we wouldn't be able to just at first glance know um, how much of the flow is going through each. We'd actually have to do the calculations on it. And so what we can do is say that the head loss through pipe B is the head loss through pipe C, and it's equal. And so this is what we can use to find out how much flow is going through each pipe. We've just substituted the Darcy-Wiesbach equation into the equivalence of head losses. And so if we have numerical values for diameter, a numerical value for the length, if we can estimate the F value, uh, if we, we can then solve for the velocity of one pipe in terms of the velocity in the other. And that's going to give us two equations, two unknowns. The, uh, the two unknowns are going to be the velocity in B and the velocity in C. Okay, so here in this equation, we've got two unknowns, which means uh, we're in trouble. But remember, we also have continuity, which says that the flow through pipe B is going to be the flow through A minus C, and the flow through pipe C is the flow through A minus B. And so the two equations, two unknowns, is continuity equation will help us relate B and A. And we can also relate the, the two pipes in this manner. So just to uh, reiterate, it doesn't matter how you get from location one, the, the first upstream junction to the downstream junction. It doesn't matter uh, what route you take, but the head loss between the two points is the same, regardless of the route. And so we change what the energy equation looks like when we're solving the nodal method. It's going to look really foreign when I bring it up on the screen. And don't panic. It looks weird like you'll never understand it. But it's the same equation, uh, same energy equation that we've seen plenty of times before. Uh, and so let me tell you how we got there. Um, H, H is just the elevation, the pressure head, and the velocity head. So that's what we mean by H, um, is the sum of the energy terms. So what this is saying is the amount of energy at location 2 is how much energy there was at 1 minus the pipe friction losses, and also minus the local losses, plus the pump head. You maybe are looking at that and saying, how, does, how do you get that from what I just said from that? Um, so v squared, uh, first of all, v squared divided by 2g. Another way to express the velocity head is q squared divided by 2ga squared. These two are equal. So here, q times the absolute value of q divided by 2ga squared, that's just another way of writing velocity head. And you may be wondering, well, velocity head, as we usually write it, is so much simpler. Why would we even bother doing this bizarre version of the velocity head? And the reason why is that sometimes what we're solving for is the flow rate rather than the velocity. And then we need to have that absolute value rather than just squaring the amount because sometimes direction is uncertain. And we have to make an assumption about direction and then check the assumption. And so uh, if we have a certain direction of flow, then we'll sometimes have a negative value. And so we're trying to preserve the sign of the flow rate, which is why we've got the absolute value in both the pump term and also the losses term. So again, the way that we would say this equation in words is the total energy 
at junction 2 is the energy at junction 1 minus the losses plus any energy gained by the pump, delivered by the pump to the system. So here are all the individual definitions here. And it's important for me to remind you that in the energy equation, we assume the flow is going from location 1 towards location 2, because different things are on each side of the equation. You know how we always write the uh, pump head on the left side of the equation. We always write the losses on the right side of the equation. And because of that, we always know that the flow is going from 1 towards 2. In other words, location 2 is downstream. Location 1 is upstream. Any questions? Uh, good question. The way that you would use this would you would just use the area of one of the pipes. And so what we would say is the head at 2 here is the head at 1 minus the losses through a single pipe plus any gains because of a pump in that pipe. So uh, it's just for a single pipe. It's not for both pipes at the same time. All right. So the method then, if this is the energy equation, then our method is let's find out how much head there is at 1 and then find the head at 2 in terms of the flow through pipe B and also in terms of the flow through pipe C. And then we relate the two using the continuity, continuity equation. Uh, so we know what the sum of the two is. And so we can, with this approach, find both the flow through each of the pipes and also how much energy loss there is from location one to location two. And that's what we're going to do in this example. Uh, what we have is a system where the flow starts here at A. We know both the, uh, the pressure of the water at that location. We also know the total flow rate at A is 3 cubic meters per second. And so that's going to be the same flow at B because it hasn't split off yet. But then when it does split, some of the flow is going to go through this pipe 2, which is the upper pipe, and some of it's going to go through pipe 3. Let me ask you this. What's the flow through pipe 4? What's the flow rate through pipe 4? 3 cubic meters per second. Uh, same as in pipe 1. Yeah. OK. Yeah, it's the same that's in this first pipe. Um, so it's galvanized iron, which we know the relative roughness for. Now, you'll notice in this table, I was able to calculate an F value for pipe 1, but I haven't put anything in for the F value for pipe 2 and pipe 3. Why is it that we can't use the normal Jane equation to find the F values for pipe 2 and 3? Why can't we use the Jane equation? Exactly. It's because we don't know the velocity. And the Jane equation depends on both relative roughness and velocity. Well, what's the tool you learned today? The tool you learned is the fully turbulent flow assumption. And that is, let's just assume for a moment that we've got really high velocities, high enough that the Reynolds number doesn't matter, and it's just the relative roughness that determines F. OK, so what I'd like you to do is calculate the F value for pipe 2 and 3 using this simplified version of the Jane equation, which is all hinging on the fully turbulent flow assumption. While you're doing those calculations, I'm going to run downstairs and grab the handout that I'd like to give you for the next homework assignment. Then I'll be back and we'll check to see if we all got the same F value.
Okay, so are we all in agreement that the F value for pipe 2 is lower than the F value for pipe 3? All right. So that's the first thing that we're going to be able to put into this equation, where what we're saying is the FLV squared divided by D2G of each pipe is equal. So what we need to do is have an expression that fills in all of the terms in that. So let me uh, we're going to fill this in. I'm going to uh, do it on the whiteboard. All right. Okay, so uh, what our starting point is is that the head loss through pipe two, well, I didn't do that. The head loss through pipe two is the same as the head loss through pipe three. That doesn't mean that the total head loss is the sum of each of them. The head loss is the same regardless of the route. So we've got a starting point upstream at location one and an ending point at location two downstream. And regardless of what route you take, it's the same amount of energy loss. Okay, so uh, it is then F2, L2, V2 squared divided by D2 times 2G is equal to F3 length through pipe 3, velocity 3 squared divided by D3, 2G. Now we just solved for our um, F values, assuming fully turbulent flow assumption. Let's rearrange this. We're still going to have two unknowns, but let's express one in terms of the other. So V2 is going to be D2 times 2G F3 L3 V3 squared. I hear a clicking in my ears. Um, F2, L2, D2, and 2G in the denominator, and that's all to the one-half power. So I'm just solving for V2, and we can simplify this because certain terms are in both the numerator and the denominator, so the 2G can cancel out. But then let's actually put the numeric substitution for the rest of these. Okay, so we've got 0 0.5 meters for D2, and now we need to put in the F3 value, 0 0.01567, and then the length of pipe 3, 550 meters, and then V3 squared, divided by 0 0.01493 times 500 meters times the diameter 0.4 meters. Okay. So will you please uh, crunch the numbers there and tell me what is V2 in terms of V3? So in other words, substitute all those terms together and we're going to have V2 is equal to some multiplier uh, times V3. Yes, thank you for noticing. Yeah, very good. To the one half power. Good. Yes. 1.204. So the velocity through pipe 2 is greater than the velocity through pipe 3. Okay. Now, remember the idea was we had two equations and two unknowns. One of the equations was this head loss relationship. The other equation is the continuity relationship, which is saying 
the flow rate through each pipe. So that was um, Q2 plus Q3 is 3 cubic meters per second. So we know that the two pipes together are 3 cubic meters per second. Did I? Oh, yeah. So this is D2. This is D3. Good catch. I was working through it too quickly. Yeah, so it's uh, the diameter 3. Because what we were doing is we were moving the D2 over there, and the D3 stays in the denominator on the right. Thank you. OK, so here's our two equations. Here's equation 1. Here's another equation. And this continuity equation, we can break it down into more pieces, because we know that Q is V times A. Right? So we're going to say V2, A2, plus V3, A3, is equal to 3 cubic meters per second. And now, if we substitute equation number one, which is our velocity relationship, if we substitute this into equation number two, then there's only one unknown. So will you do that? And uh, with a partner or individually, tell me what is V2 and what is V3? We're looking for how many meters per second the flow is going to be through each of those pipes. So V2 is what meters per second? V3 is what meters per second? And what you're doing is you're putting in the actual numeric values any place you know them. And where you don't, you're making the substitution that V2 is 1.204 V3. Did you get 8.29 meters per second for the velocity through pipe 3 and 9.98 for the velocity through pipe 2? If so, then that's good, because that's what I also got. Um, so two equations, two unknowns. We're able to find the velocity through each. And so then that tells us what the flow rate through each is going to be. Once we have the velocity, then it's relatively straightforward to then just multiply the velocity in pipe 3 through its cross-sectional area. That tells us it's 1.04 cubic meters per second going through pipe 3. We can now likewise calculate the flow through pipe 2, 1.96 cubic meters per second. And uh, let's check just to make sure that that adds up to uh, 3 cubic meters per second. And it does within a uh, thousandth of a cubic meter per second. So that's good. So are we done? Did we get it? Oh, thank you. You didn't fall for my trap. I was hoping we wouldn't be done. Yes, we need to uh, check this assumption, the fully turbulent flow assumption. So the way that we check it is let's recalculate the F values, this time with the full Jane equation. And uh, we're going to see if the full version of the Jane equation gives us the same F value that we used the first time around. And if it doesn't, that means we need to do this step where we set the two equal. We need to do that step again and calculate adjusted flow values. So I mean, it's not the end of the world if our fully turbulent flow assumption isn't correct. Because even the assumption gets us close enough that in our second iteration, uh, the answer improves. OK, so uh, we need to check the validity of the, this is like I know what you did last summer here, 
It's like the blood on smearing on the walls or something. Um, all right, so we'll calculate the Reynolds number through pipe two. So the Reynolds number through pipe two, velocity in pipe two, diameter divided by the kinematic viscosity, so 9.98 meters per second. The diameter of pipe two is 0 0.50 meters and 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. So that uh, Reynolds number through pipe 2 is 4.99 times 10 to the 6th. The Reynolds number through pipe 3 is 8.29 meters per second, 0 0.40 meters and 1 times 10 to the minus 6th meters squared per second. So that is 3.316 times 10 to the 6th. All right, calculate new F values. So the new F using the full Jane equation. Okay, and the full Jane equation, let me bring it back up on screen here. Here's the full Jane equation that you should calculate an updated F value. We still have our original roughness, 0.15 millimeters. We've got our original diameters. Just what's changing now is the second term is not being neglected. So F2 and F3. So we're checking to make sure that you know, all of our calculations so far were contingent on the simplified version of the Jane equation. And the reason why we did that was we couldn't otherwise calculate the F value through pipe 2 and pipe 3. It was one of those chicken and the egg scenarios where we didn't know the velocity, so we couldn't calculate the F value. But we didn't know the F value, so we couldn't calculate the velocity. And so we had to. Uh, cut the back and forth and just say, well, let's ignore the effective velocity at first and calculate the F value just on the basis of its relative roughness. And then as we check, what we get is your uh, new F value is 0 0.14, excuse me, 0 0.01498. What was our first version of F2? Because we'll. All right, let's consider it on a percentage basis because, you know, just looking at the numbers, at first glance it may be tough to uh, immediately know whether it's close enough. 1%, 2% is usually plenty close for an F value. So our old F value was uh, for pipe two, 0. 0.1493, assuming fully turbulent, then this corrected one is 0 0.01498 divided by 0 0.01498. And I'm dividing by the more recent slash updated version because that's the one I think is closer to being correct. So when we want to do a percent difference, we'll do the difference between the two relative to the one that we think is most correct. So it's that difference divided by the correct one multiplied by 100. And I actually don't have that percent calculated on my notes, but I'll. The difference, I think, not much is 0 0.0151. 151? Yeah. I wonder if it's. I mean, I think the only thing it could be is whether one of us rounded off with the Reynolds number. Did you round off, or did you use? I think what I must have done was keep all of that precision in my calculator, and that this number is based on 4.99, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I've started changing my solution when I don't round off to have like dot, dot, dot as just an indicator that there are some more digits there. It's just that we're not going to write them all out on the page. 
Okay, so uh, percent difference. Let's take a look here. So we've got 0 0.01493 minus 0 0.01498 divided by 0 0.01498 multiplied by 100. So it is uh, negative 0.33% difference. Minus meaning that our original guess was too small of an F value compared to this new one that we know is more accurate. So that's fine. Less than 1% and we're golden. We don't have to repeat the process just because of uh, pipe two. Let's check out uh, pipe three to make sure that the fully turbulent flow is an acceptable guess there. Our original F value for pipe three was 0 0.01567, and this newly updated one is 0 0.01592, divided by the one that we think is more correct, multiplied by 100. All right. 0 0.01567, 0 0.01592, so the difference, then divided by 0.1592, multiply by 100. All right, it is negative 1.57%. I said 1 to 2 percent is accurate. I'm glad I did. I'm glad I didn't say 1 percent. And that saves us having to go through this whole process again. But what if I was really being a stickler? What if I would said it's got to be less than 1% difference? So what would we do? We would take these new F values and we'd start back over here. So we'd substitute those improved F values in here. We follow the same process of finding the velocity at 2 in terms of the velocity at 3. We'd substitute it into continuity. We'd solve for these new velocities, find the flow rates, check to make sure it equals 3. And the flow rates would be so infinitesimally small, that the difference, that um, we'd be kicking ourselves for going through the second iteration. But at least we'd have the ability to sleep well at night knowing that we'd been accurate and we'd check the fully turbulent flow assumption. All right. Any questions about that process? You're going to get a chance to practice that process. And uh, let me give you the handout for the uh, upcoming homework assignment. The, uh, the homework assignment bumps, bumps it up a notch because the system that you've got connects three pipes, not just two. You know, you've already done two pipes. You're ready for something bigger. I would insult you with such an easy question again. Okay. So here's some hints. Here's like a suggested flow. What I suggest you do on, uh, so there's problem 42, and then there's a handout problem. This is some tips on problem 42. So just the fact that there's three conduits, actually, it doesn't change things at all. Uh, because the, the governing principle that the amount of energy at the upstream junction and the amount of energy at the downstream junction, that difference is the same regardless of the route that you take. So we can say that F1, L, F1, L1, V1 squared divided by D2G, so that's equal to situation at 2, which is also equal to the situation at 3. So I hope that uh, this step-by-step -step procedure will maybe remind you that um, it's, this isn't so bad. This problem 40, 42 isn't so bad. But what is so bad is the handout problem. <laughs> and it's not bad because it's hard. It's bad just because uh, sometimes students use the wrong equation. I've tried to eliminate any uncertainty. You'll notice in caps down here in tips, I say, this is not a hardy cross problem. Use the nodal method because you're supposed to use the nodal method, which you've just learned today to solve this one. 
in class next week, uh, please bring your laptop to class uh, on Tuesday because you're going to learn an approach called the Hardy Cross Method. No, this is Tuesday. I meant Thursday. Bring a class, bring a laptop to class on Thursday because we're going to be using Excel. And sometimes people get so excited about that Excel method that we're going to le learn on Thursday, they try and apply it here, but it doesn't apply here. This is a nodal method problem. Now, there's lots of, of hints down here in the tips section, but broadly, let me just explain to you what's happening. We've got two reservoirs, and the reservoir that's connected to junction A has an elevation of 25 meters. And what that does is that tells us how much head there is at A. There's 25 meters of head at A. Because we're going to assume that this pipe that connects the reservoir and junction A is super small. So there's effectively no losses through that pipe. So what we can say is H sub A is 25 meters. And we can say something similar about junction B. Because there's a reservoir connected to junction B, then that means that the head at that location is known. But we don't know, at least not directly, what's the head at location C or at location D. And it depends on the flow direction. And what's a little confusing at first about this problem is we don't exactly know what route the water is taking. Let me just write a couple of possibilities on the board so you can see what I mean. So one possibility, if this is our system, is the water comes in at A, and the water is exiting at D, and there's also water coming in here at C, and water going in here at uh, B. OK. So it could be like this. It could be, let me draw it in a different color. It could be that the water's going from A to D, and from A to C, from C to B, and from D to B. So that's one possibility, but it's not required for the water to go that direction. Um, it could be that it's this, that the water is going from C to A. So that's another possibility. What you have to do is you have to make an assumption, a guess, and then check the guess uh, through the process that I outline in the handout. Um, but what we know, remember, is the heads. We know how much energy there is at A. So the head at A is 25 meters, right? We all agree. See this flow arrow that I've drawn from C to A? If the flow direction's that way, what is the head at C if the flow direction is from C towards A? It's greater than 25, exactly right. So in an equation form, what we could say is the head at C is 25 plus some losses. Um, and the, uh, the losses are going to be related to, like, what's the characteristics of the pipe. And in the handout, I uh, suggest that you could um, calculate R values. And we'll talk more about R values when we uh, have class on Thursday. But an R value is basically resistance to flow. And the bigger an R value, the more resistance to flow there is. And so what you can see is that what you do is this idea of the R value. We already learned today that H sub F is F L V squared divided by D 2 G, or F L Q squared divided by D 2 G A squared. And those are the same. That's all this R value is. Look at how we're using it. We calculate some R value, and then we multiply it by Q squared. So what we're saying is head at C is head at A plus 
R Q squared if the flow direction is that way. Does everybody see why that's the case? Why there is more energy at C? Because if we say the water is flowing from C to A, the only way that's possible is if there's more energy at C. Water can only flow from high energy towards low energy. But my original assumption was that the flow is this way. And if that was the case, then the head at C would be 25 minus R Q squared, and so on and so forth. The uh, thing that makes this problem interesting is that we can write the flow rate through here in terms of the, uh, the head that we know, but the Q itself will be unknown, but then we do know the, uh, the continuity equation at a junction. And so this flow out at junction D is 0 0.2 cubic meters per second. So what that means is that combining these two together, if this is an in and that's an out, then the whole combination at that junction has to be in balance. The flow in and the flow out has to be in balance at that junction. All right. I don't want to say too much more about it yet because I feel like it would be robbing you of the beautiful puzzle that is this problem. It's like Sudoku, but better. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So what he's getting at is, how do you know if you've made the wrong assumption? What are the indicators of that? And it is that you'll get a mathematically impossible solution. I think in the hints, what I say is, uh, if your initial flow direction guess might turn out to be invalid, if so, it'll be a mathematically impossible solution. Like, what you'll be doing is you'll be putting things into the uh, continuity equation and It'll, just, it'll tell you something like a negative is equal to a positive, and you know that's not true, so you'll know that you have to switch your flow assumption. So this assignment is due on is it Tuesday of next week. You should begin it now, um, not because it's going to take you that long, but just because if you have follow-up questions, then you've got all this week to uh, bounce them off of me. What we're going to do in class on Thursday does not address this homework, so there's no reason to delay. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you next time. Please remember to bring your laptop computer.